Uh, first of all, I want to acknowledge that we are on the traditional territory of the Musqueam, Coast Salish First Nation. Um, their traditional lands uh, covered most of the area around Vancouver, especially on uh, where the, the university is, as well as Richmond and um, adjacent areas. And uh, to the north, we have uh, other Coast Salish peoples as well, whose territory is um, shared in some cases. Um, but these are people who have lived in this area for thousands and thousands of years and have built up tremendous knowledge and wisdom about living well in the place. I can't really begin to uh, pay enough tribute to the people who have been my teachers over this time. And uh, some of them have now passed on, but to me, they're always still, they're still here. I can still see their faces, I can hear them, I can hear their voices. And many of them are still with us today. I just had lunch uh, yesterday with, um, with Ron Ignace, um, the corner holding choke cherries. Uh, elected chief of the Skechiston band of the Shuswap Nation. Um, Dr. Richard Adlio got his, was the first indigenous uh, doctoral student to complete at UBC. And uh, he lives out of Chilliwack now, but he's from the Housing First Nation uh, on the West Coast. All of these people, I could just talk about each one of them for the entire time and tell you stories about my times out in the field with them and what they've, been, uh, what they've taught and how they've passed along their knowledge to their family members, um, many of whom uh, I still keep in touch with. And of course, I really love the idea of being out there with elders and kids together because it's wonderful to see the joy of learning that is uh, embodied in the kids as they go through their daily activities, harvesting seaweed and so forth. And that reminds me, um, I brought along some of the seaweed, and I'll start passing it around because it's going to take a while. And you have to share this, this one bag, but feel free to help yourself to it and taste it. And I, I can confirm that it's edible. Maybe I should try eating it. <laughs> But this is the kind of seaweed um, that I'll be talking about later, Hyropia abati. And it's one that's uh, very, very important on the coast, uh, but it's, people have great concerns about it because this year, for the first time ever, it didn't appear on the rocks like that. Every year it has. This year, there were just little strands of it, and people are saying that's, that's the impact of climate change. I was just up in Harvey Bay in September, and that's where the seedlings came from, by the way. And uh, they, they were able to pick some, but just not as much as uh, they would normally get. So these kids now, that was taken maybe about eight years ago, they're all grown up now. It's amazing how fast those kids grow. So, um, the whole idea of writing that book uh, was on ancient, ancient pathways, ancestral knowledge. I started thinking quite a while ago, actually, about learning all of this rich knowledge from different places, mostly within British Columbia, but within North and Western North America. The names and the stories and the ways of cooking and the ways of harvesting. And I guess what came to me is how, how much commonality there is in the way that people relate to plants and their environments across this huge area, um, across linguistic boundaries, across geographic boundaries. So, and the richness of their knowledge of, of all of these individuals, the elders I've worked with, where did it come from? How did they learn it? You know, who discovered it to begin with? How did they pass it on? How did they share it? How did they adapt it across time and space? And so the whole idea of working on that book was to try and, uh, to try and puzzle it out, how, how that happened, and uh, ways that, uh, <coughs> the pathways, for example. I'll start with a quick story, 
and then just uh, talk a little bit about sharing knowledge and uh, associated methods and beliefs and so forth. Give a few examples and, um, and then some conclusions. Um, so we'll get started. There's a lot of diversity in the way people use plants throughout Northwestern North America, but there are also uh, commonalities. And so the question is, you know, how did how did this situation come come to be? Um, how did people share their stories and their ceremonies and their, um, the way they look after plants, the way they uh, divide up the work, the way they teach? How did it develop? Here's my friend Celia, Belinda Claxton, harvesting cedar bark, which is a great example. Um, it seems from the palynology, now some of you might correct me here, but that a western red cedar, Thuya placata, has only been really common on the coast, especially on the north coast, uh, within the last 5,000 or so years, maybe even less. And so the question is, cedar is so important to coastal first peoples now, what did they do before they were cedar? What, what, you know, and how did they learn how to use cedar? And when, where, how did they share that? So there it all is. There are several hundred different species of plants that have names in, uh, in all of the different languages um, in Northwestern North America, and a lot of animal and seafood species as well, fish. And, uh, insects, birds, mammals, names for hundreds of different species. And of course, associated with that is all of this knowledge that I'm uh, talking about. And that's, that's the book. Take a look at this, uh, the photos on the covers of the two volumes. Their hands that are twisting, and the hands of the line to Sam Mitchell, who is one of my, the main teachers I worked with when I was doing my doctoral work. And I'm really happy to see a couple of plant collections over here that uh, I made when I was working with Sam Mitchell on different varieties of Saskatoon berries, which they call smukumbul. Well, Sam's showing how to make rope with a kind of will called nakutinas, say let's say a Sibi one. And, and uh, so this shows that. Um, and I was really delighted when the designer decided to that on the covers of the book because I have such fond memories of Sam and all of his teachings. And I'll show you a little bit later in the, at the end a picture of, the full picture of Sam making that rope. So there are approximately 50 languages and major dialects spoken uh, from the central Alaska and the Yukon south to the Columbia River and east to the Rocky Mountains. And um, within that same region, of course, there's a tremendous diversity of geography and uh, vegetation, many different vegetation zones, and within those different habitats that provide uh, different kinds of plant resources for people. And so you put that all together in a time frame, you're going to get a lot of diversity here. And well, the first thing that I did when I started working on this book was to make a database of plant names in all of those 50 languages and major dialects. And guess which kind, which plant had names in all 50? It was wild rose. Now, it was, there were several species I have to admit. There's the nook rose on the, on the northwest coast and the prickly rose, rosa. Acicularis in the interior, and Rosa woodsia, smaller flower grows, but pretty much the same places where more than one species occurs, people would call them by the same name, though you recognize the differences. So it's sort of a, a complex name, and it covers multiple species, but one kind of thing, really. I, I was using the names, in a way, as proxies for knowledge. If, uh, if a name is shared across two languages, uh, it indicates that there's some kind of connection between them. 
obviously, more than just uh, independent discovery because you're not going to have the same name if, it, if two people are, two different groups of people are using the same plan but um, discovered it independently. So, for example, with the rose, not surprisingly, a lot of the names uh, in the, especially in the Athabascan languages, refer to the thorns. So, Hwas is an Athabascan term that means thorn. Hwas Cho means big thorn. And you can see the different Athabascan language names, all in blue, uh, have that, this, a similar kind of related term. And then you have the Xinjianic names are related, Nista and Xinjiang. And you might know the town called Lakbalams, that's a place of wild rose off Prince uh, uh, Rupert. So more names, you can see the Salishan names in green, and then in the interior, uh, a different etamon, they call it, a, a different, uh, uh, completely different name. So I just want to talk a little bit about this sharing idea that goes on even to the present day. But there is Sam Mitchell in the middle of two of his buddies. Sam was from Hatcha, or what used to be called Fountain, up in Fraser County. And his friends, uh, um, Charlie Mack and Baptist Ritchie, are from Mount Curry, Lilwa. And down in this, in the bottom, is Arthur Adolf, who is Sam's adopted son. And he is um, still a good friend of ours, and I see him from time to time. So Art told this story of when he was a little boy, he grew up with his, actually his grandfather, Sam, and his grandmother, Susan, Sam's wife. And Susan used to organize trips uh, by the train, by the old PTE rail, from Lillooet down to Mount Curry. And uh, Susan and Art and uh, Sam and a, a group of people, maybe a dozen, would go down there and they'd meet their relatives from Mount Curry and they'd all take the train up to Whistler area, Alta Lake, and they'd spend uh, time up in cabins and they'd go up and pick mountain um, huckleberries that seemed to remember Nazi mostly and some of the other blueberries of the, of the Montane region. And when they got back, Susan would always make sure that everyone in the Hashtag community got, uh, got their own berries, even the ones who weren't able to go and pick. And then a little while later, or maybe the next year, maybe earlier, um, the Mount Curry folks would come up by the train, and Sam and family would pick them up, and they'd take them up into the Fountain Valley to pick Skoshan, the soap berry. And again, they'd bring the soap berries back to Mount Curry and they'd share them around down there. So that was just one example of two groups of people with connections across them who would uh, travel back and forth and exchange knowledge and exchange goods with each other as part of a, a sort of ongoing arrangement. That's uh, something that we wrote a paper about called Ecological Edges and Cultural Edges. This would be a, an example of a cultural edge. It's not a physical thing, but it's a place where different groups of people come together and exchange knowledge and, and ideas. So our friend Dolly Watts from the, uh, she now lives on Vancouver Island, but she speaks Sam. She is a chef and she talked about how important these goods were for uh, sharing, bartering, trading as a gift for a gift. Trade included sharing land that had a profusion of berries or hunting grounds full of game, as there was an abundance of seafood on the coast, and similarly, an excess of meat and berries among the big sounds. The exchange offered variety in our diets. My friend uh, Helen, Pla Helen Clifton from Hartley Bay, I was just talking to her about that. She was remembering how people would come down the Spina River and bring soap berries and Saskatoon berries down and trade them for, uh, for their dried halibut and clams. Blue and grease and seaweed are two of those. There is Helen right there with her granddaughter Janelle. And she's teaching Janelle how to, how to process the dried halibut there. I love that picture because to me it just, it, 
it is so illustrative of how knowledge is passed on. Children learn by doing, learn by experience, and um, they probably don't even know that they're learning. Janelle's in her late teens now. That was taken a long time ago, 2003, I think. So all of these different concepts and uh, were, were exchanged, learned, and adapted, not just the goods themselves, but the knowledge about how to harness them, how to process them, and um, the implements that were used and so forth. So the technique of making twine, for example, and the kind of fiber that people use. And uh, I have as an illustration the uh, design of digging sticks. These are root diggers that are an amazing implement. They're sort of like a shovel, but you don't really use them like a shovel. It's more like a lever. Where you push them into the ground and you pry, and you push them in and pry back until you get a, a big area like this of turf. And then you push in really hard and you flip the whole thing over. And there are your edible roots, your camas balls, or your clover, or whatever it is that you're digging. You can just select the big ones and leave the little ones behind, flip it back over, pull a few of the weedy grasses out. Uh, sorry, Jack. And, uh, <laughs> and um, yeah, Bob's your uncle. <laughs> uh, so there are these different designs of digging sticks, and I've just shown you a couple. One made of, uh, the, the group there, made of yew wood. The one leaning against the birch tree is black author, made by my friend Mary Thomas. And Adam Dick, my friend uh, from the Quapapwak Nation, is using uh, one of the yew wood digging sticks. And the ones in the red background, I'll talk about in a minute. But all of these things, uh, the processes and the knowledge that goes with them are what I shared. And I just had the most amazing experience this uh, August going out with a group from Bella Coola. Um, and, and it took me all these years, since 1972, to try and figure out what the sweet smelling grass that Dave Moody told me about back in 1972 that grew down in the river estuary. And I didn't know what it was, and I wrote in, the, in my thesis this sweet grass that people used in ceremony. Well, it turns out, this is Dave Moody's son, Sam Moody, who's a well-known herbalist. And um, he knew about the grass from his dad. And, and other people in the Malakula community learned about it. And they said they learned about sweetgrass long ago from people from Alberta who came out, the Blackfeet people, who came out and uh, taught them about sweetgrass, and they have it growing all over the estuary in Malakula, and I didn't even know it, because it's not flowering. There's no fruits or flowers with it. It's just mixed in amongst all the other grasses. So, you know, I don't know how far back that knowledge goes or when they learned about it, but there's a good example of how a ceremonial uh, product has been shared. <laughs> We sure had fun that day. And as I mentioned, the voc botanical vocabulary um, is a great reflection, a proxy for a whole knowledge system, really. The names that people give. The very fact that people give a name to a plant indicates that it has some cultural importance to those people. And um, most of you, well, some of you will know tons and tons of names of plants. But a lot of you, unless you're professional botanists, you probably maybe know maybe 500 or maybe 1,000 names, but no more than that. There's lots of plants that you probably don't know the names for because they're not so salient for you. And that's the same with First Nations. You can tell which plants are important by the ones that have names attached to them. So I'm just going to give you a few examples quickly of uh, a few of these names. So these are the, the species I've been talking about. Ocean spray, polydiscus, this color. Um, let's look, have a look at the shisha, uh, Squamish names and Sputlum. They all mean digging stick plant. And it's one of the plants that is used to make uh, digging sticks. 
in the interior. It comes from um, a word, uh, well, nobody really knows whether this is a folk etymology um, that is a, a false meaning for a name that was attributed, but it seems to be named, named for a blonde color, which is the, the color of the flowers. And that name has been used throughout the interior Salish area. As, as well, it has the cognate on the uh, post with the new call, and Comops. And this uh, Sagittarium, we have a sample here, um, is particularly interesting because they found, they made this amazing discovery in 2009, I think it was, not that long ago, of these almost a pure patch of Wapato, Sagittarian, um, at Pit Poker when they were digging the foundations for the new bridge there in the Cape Sea Territory. And um, when, they, when they tested, they found them mixed in with the ends of these digging sticks, which you can see down there. And when they tested them, 3,500 years old. And they were associated with camp areas and uh, hard sites, so people were camping there, harvesting Wapato 3,500 years ago, just up the Fraser Valley from here. And the names, it, I mean, I didn't even realize the interior people used uh, Wapato until I started working with Mary Thomas, a uh, Stratmook elder who lived at Salmonar. And she said, yeah, we used to go down and get this this uh, tuber, like a marble, she said, and our granny would dig it and throw it up on the bank. And we called it popolos, which means yellow, jaundiced yellow eyeball. <laughs> <laughs> and, and then when I started doing this comparison, lo, lo and behold, popolos is related to, not just to um, the neighboring Chakatmuk people, the Thompson, but also to Squamish and Upriver Polkamino, or, or Squam, um, so. But there's also another set of names, scouts and things like that, that is now used for potato. So it just shows how things can evolve over time. Then this is a neat one. Camas, both species, Camasia, Quamash, and Lathini, and Naughty Onion, and other onions, have a similar ancient root name, Polaj, Polaj, which means edible tuber, the Proto-Salish, the earliest ancestral language of the Salish. And so in one direction, on Vancouver Island and um, down into the Puget Sound, the name sort of got transferred to Camassia, but up in the interior, it got transferred to onion. And so Polawa'ul, the real original onion, is this Latinoch name. Which I, found, which I learned about when I was doing my doctoral work. But until I saw the whole pattern of how these names are related across time and space, I didn't realize just you know, uh, how amazing it was and how ancient this knowledge must be. Here's the seaweed that I'm passing around. I hope you're enjoying the taste of it, wherever it is. Um, and this is how it's dried up in uh, this keel of the seaweed camp. Um, and, lo and behold, the name, this a common name, Edmond, is used from the Yupik people up in Alaska, right down to the Strait Salish and Lummi in uh, Puget Sound. Some variant of Shakstan, Shakas, or Shakas, um, but it, it's all a related term. It means that at some point, you know, people were exchanging the knowledge of edible seaweed up and down the coast. It would have been quite a long time ago. And another one is the um, silkberry, which again I learned from Sam Mitchell, learned how to use it, and the potion, how it was whipped into a foamy, uh, really delicious, for some of us, uh, frothy food. <laughs> it has a slight bitter taste to it, just as a word. But yes, these things are really neat. They come from, there's only a few different original terms. One is 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 a Scythianic name, is or us. Or the Scythianic Haida, which I learned about. Us, which I didn't realize was borrowed from uh, the Scythianic languages. The 
because the mass at Haydn being cuckoo plate is not related at all. It's it's borrowed from Klinge. But anyways, um, some of the uh, the after that means like ish go go that means ish very. I know that because my my call pen name is teach a baker that which means very well. <laughs> I'm rather proud of that name. <laughs> <laughs> um, but look at this. All 18 Salish names, every single Salish language has the same name for software derived from the original Proto Salish, Kosh, or Kosh, which means homing or frothing. Isn't that neat? So, well, that's the summary. I don't want to go into that because uh, I'm going to run out of time. But um, it's pretty interesting how this amazing fruit that in the rest of Canada people think of it as being poisonous. Here in northwestern North America, in British Columbia, it's like an amazing party food that people talk about. There's even a higher word, acha, which means smeared with soap berries. So you can imagine. <laughs> <laughs> find it in the Yukon now, grows right across northern Canada in the Boreal Forest. I think it's one of the first fruits that people learned about, and somehow that idea of whipping it into a foamy broth um, caught on here, but not, not in the rest of the continent. Spread cabbage, another one that I just love, and there's lots of neat things about spread cabbage. One thing is you should not eat it. You don't <laughs> eat the leaves of spent cabbage. They have sharp crystals of calcium oxalate in them, and they'll get embedded in your tongue and swell it up and make it very miserable for you. I, I, have, I haven't tried it, but I've had accounts from people who have, including our friend Allison, right? Um, anyways, but the leaves get really big. They can get this tall and this wide, and you can dry berries on them because they have a waxy coating on the surface. You can see how shiny they are. And so uh, they, they make an excellent surface for, for laying food on or drying berries on and that kind of thing. And the rhizomes are sometimes used as a famine food and have been in the past. They have to be roasted and cooked to get rid of that peppery flavor, but nevertheless, um, they, they were used and associated with in times of scarcity by some people. So you can see there's, um, there's a, a whole raft of names from uh, the Wakashan language, which would be the Kwakwala and uh, Hiltsuk and Haisla, um, that, that have borrowed the Proto Salish word for spent cabbage. And then all of the Salish peoples um, have this um, uh, related terms that, are, that come from the Proto-Salish term oh. But there's a whole other etymon that is really intriguing to me because I first learned about it when I was working in the west coast of Vancouver Island. The name Tima or Tina or Tibut in Didadap. Then I learned, you go over to the east, you skip a whole area where they use that other name, and you go to Shratmuk, the Shushaw area. The Okanagan, um, the Kurdele, and Spokane, and, and uh, the Salish or Flathead people over in Montana, and even the Tanaha, which is a totally different language, a borrowed this term, Tima or Tumu or Tina. Um, and how did that happen? I can only suggest that maybe they all met down at the mouth of the Columbia River and exchanged that name along with the knowledge of how to use the plant. And there's neat stories. There's a Haida story about a scum cabbage man who actually provided a family that was in need with a, a, a boy would go out and he saw a ditch being dug and he went there the next day and it had salmon in it. And the next day it had two salmon. And, and he found out the person who was giving him the salmon was scum cabbage man. And then you go down to the mouth of the Columbia and Francois recorded this amazing story 
about the people in the ancient times before the salmon came up the river. All they had to eat was wapato and stuffed cabbage. And, uh, and when the salmon people came, they saw this person over on the bank. They went over and the person said, if it hadn't been for me, the people would have starved. And that was stunt cabbage. And so they said in the story, so they gave stunt cabbage an elk skin blanket and a war club. And that's why stunt cabbage is so beautiful today. So how did those two stories get connected? They, they are connected in a way with similar things. So far, I have the wide Columbia River. And then uh, just one more example um, to, to wind up with. The whole notion of cooking in an underground pit. Um, it, we know, of course, that Polynesians did that, the Hawaiians have done that. Um, in North America, we know that in Chile, they did cooking. And in Mexico, they pit cooked agave. And um, it seems that the earliest archaeological record for North America was in Texas, uh, maybe going back eight or 9,000 years ago. And gradually the idea of pit cooking seemed to have moved north because it uh, came into the Willamette Valley about 6,000 years ago and then up into uh, central Washington about 5,000 years ago. And then, uh, well, just, just uh, you can tell about pit cooking from the archaeological record, which is a uh, kind of a dip in the ground. It looks like a cattle wallow or something, but it has charred rock, charred uh, wood and firecrack rock in it. It sometimes remains of plants like camas. And so in British Columbia, we have all of these records of pit cooking going back maybe 3,000 years max. So it seems like that tradition started in North America from the south and moved, moved up north. That there's still a lot to be found, a lot to know about. Um, and, but these are some of the foods that people have pit cooked. And like the camas is well known, it's almost always pit cooked. And the main carbohydrate, indolent, is broken down during the pit cooking process into fructans and fructose, which are very digestible and sweet tasty. Otherwise, camas. If you just ate it well, it's really tasty and sort of uh, mucilaginous and it's uh, not very digestible either. The same with the onions. Kolawaul, the gnawing onions here, they would braid them and cook them in a pit. One of the neatest things that we learned from my master's students, to Trafford, who worked with Trevor Gowart, some of you know Trevor, um, he did his master's looking at black tree lichen, Briorio Fremonti. And he was assumed that pit cooking, because the lichen's almost pit cooked, would break down the lichen carbohydrates into something more digestible. But he couldn't break them down, no matter what he did. He, he tried all kinds of methods. One of the things he did was cook them with camas balls and onions. And guess what? He found that the lichen absorbed about 30% of the fructans from the camas and the onions that would have otherwise been lost into the, the pit cook material. And, and so in, in essence, the lichen helped people to increase the efficiency of their harvest of the edible roots. It's pretty neat stuff. Um, that's just lots more stories about pit cooking. I wish I could tell you more. But it's time to close. You might have some questions. So just um, in conclusion then, I, I believe that sharing this knowledge helps people to adapt. It helps them to be resilient, to respond to change and uh, to different things that present themselves to them. Having access to a variety of different uh, products that you, you can count on, you can trade, or you know uh, where you can go and get if you need to. And that the, the common names across the languages are a good indicator of widespread cultural importance of these species and widespread sharing of knowledge, practice, and belief. And there is Sam twisting the rope willow at, at a place called Pavilion along the highway between Lytton and uh, Cache Creek. Um, 
Unfortunately, they widened the highway and the whole population of the Sandbar Willow was wiped out at that spot. But, um, and Sam may well be one of the last people who knew how to make that rope because they used it for tying their houses together, making rafts, suspension bridges to, to go across the Fraser River. Can you imagine? Um, and I, I mentioned at the bottom, key spiritual and ethical dimensions are also involved, allowing long-term sustainability and adapt adaptability. And I put the, the picture of the grouse nest here. That is a nest that belongs to our friend, uh, Clan Chief Adam Dick. Waxistala, and it uh, is part of a dance, a ceremonial dance that he has the prerogative to present about a boy who went out and hunted grouse, and they're so easy to kill. He killed a whole bunch of them. He was pretty proud of himself for killing all these grouse. But when he got home, uh, he went to sleep, and he had a dream. And in the dream, the door of the forest came and opened up to him. And all of the different elements of the forest came and danced before him. Each one has a mask. There are about 20 masks in this dance. Uh, the grouse was the first, and then came uh, the trees, and the fish, and the birds, and the wind, and the water, and emotions, and aging. All of these had their own masks and birth. And, uh, by the time he saw, witnessed all of these different elements of the forest and how connected they were and how, um, how important the grouse was to the ecosystem there. He realized that he had taken too many grouse and he learned his lesson. And that, whenever that dance is performed, it conveys that lesson to anybody who's watching it. I told Adam, it's sort of like a full course in forest ecology in one hour. <laughs> and I just want to emphasize that this knowledge that I'm talking about, it's not dead. It's not in the past. It's still being transmitted and used, maybe in different ways and people are using different modes of communication like, like YouTube and apps and things. Um, but still, um, it's really important today and uh, all of the people that I work with are trying really hard to maintain and sustain their languages and their traditional food systems and their lands and the integrity of the lands and to keep looking after them as their ancestors did. Thank you very much. <coughs>